Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about plate tectonics. Um, so if you're following along in the Marshak book, this is chapter two. If you're following along in the online book, it is most of the material is in chapter 10. So if I bring up the online material here and we go down to uh, the table of contents, there's an introduction of this, uh, fundamentals of plate tectonics in chapter one. But I think that uh, part of plate tectonics is so fundamental to geology that I think we should talk about it earlier. Mm -hmm. But for similar material to the online book, you're going to refer to chapter 10 on plate tectonics. Okay. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the continental drift hypothesis. Uh, the different evidence that we have for plate tectonics and why it exists. And uh, we're going to talk about the three major types of plate boundaries. So last lecture, we talked about the Earth's internal structure. And uh, if you remember, we have the solid inner core. We have a somewhat liquid outer core, the lower mantle, upper mantle, asthenosphere, lithosphere, and the crust. Tectonic plates move on top of the asthenosphere and occur at that boundary, which is remember what we call the, the MOHO. So continental drift theory is the theory that the Earth's continents have moved over geologic time relative to each other, and therefore appearing as though they've drifted on top of the Earth's surface. So if we see this picture here uh, on the right, um, these years represent millions of years ago. So in geologic time, when we talk about the Permian, you can see that all the continents were once together, and uh, we call that Pangaea. In the Triassic era, um, they started to drift apart, and we have one major mass year that we call Gondwana land, and then Lower Asia. And uh, 150 million years ago, you can see that the continents are spreading apart. Here's a picture of how the plates were in the Cretaceous era, and then today, uh, this is what we see now where we have uh, a lot of distance between these continents and uh, vast oceans as opposed to one large mass as it was in the Permian about 225 million years ago. Okay, so I'm going to hit pause here and refer you to a quick YouTube video of how plate, te plate tectonics is explained. The idea that our planet's continents drift around the globe, periodically glomming together and breaking apart, is at least 200 years old. But most geologists didn't believe it until the 1960s, when mounting evidence made it clear that the Earth's crust is broken up into fragments, and that those fragments, called tectonic plates, are moving. And these days we directly track that motion, with millimeter precision, from space. The common, simplified explanation for why tectonic plates are moving is that they're carried along on currents in the upper mantle, the slowly flowing layer of rock just below Earth's crust. Converging currents drive plates into each other, diverging currents pull them apart. This is mostly true. Hot mantle rock rises from the core and moves along under the crust until it grows cool and heavy and sinks back down again. But the plates aren't just passively riding these currents around like a bunch of suitcases at the baggage claim. They can't be, because some of the plates are moving faster than the currents underneath them. For example, the Nazca Plate, a chunk of ocean crust off the west coast of South America, is cruising eastward at about 10 centimeters per year, while the mantle underneath it oozes along at just 5. Neither tectonic plates nor luggage can move faster than the belts they're riding on unless something else is helping to push or pull them along. And some of Earth's plates, it turns out, are pulling themselves. When an ocean plate collides with another ocean plate, or a plate bearing the thick crust of continental landmasses, the thinner of the two plates bends and slides under the other. As the edge of the sea floor sinks into the mantle, it pulls on the plate behind it, the same way a chain dangling further and further off a table will eventually start to slide. The bigger the sunken portion of the plate becomes, the harder it pulls and the faster the remaining plate behind it moves. You can find where this is happening just by looking at Google Earth. The incredibly deep, narrow ocean trenches visible off the coasts of some continents and island chains mark the creases formed as ocean crust plunges downward, bending the edge of its neighbor in the process. What's more, these chunks of seafloor are actually helping to drive convection in the mantle beneath them. Sunken slabs of ocean crust block flowing rock from moving further sideways, forcing it to turn downwards and sink. 
and eventually those slabs get too heavy and break off, plunging slowly toward the core and creating a suction force that pulls mantle material along behind them. So in some ways, seafloor crust is really more like part of the conveyor belt than something riding on top of it. The continents, on the other hand, are baggage. So what I'd really liked about this video is that it used the analogy of plates as luggage on top of a conveyor belt, which uh, describes plate tectonics. And it also talked about convection, which is uh, the mode in which plates are able to move. The video also introduced that the plates are moving relative to each other at different rates, uh, which we can measure today. So all of these concepts that were condensed into this short YouTube video, we're going to talk about more at length right now. So like the video suggested, um, Plate tectonics hasn't been around that long. Uh, Alfred Wegener first theorized uh, continental drift in the early 1920s, and Harry Hess carried on the theory into the 1960s. By 1968 and the early 70s, geologists had sufficient evidence for plate tectonics, and we're going to go over what that evidence is. But to put that into perspective, the Great Depression was from 1929 to 1939, and so we hadn't established plate tectonics by the end of the Great Depression. And plate tectonics was uh, more accepted when President Nixon was in office. So to put this in a little bit more perspective, uh, this guy was one of my professors in school when I was a student. And his name is Warren Hamilton. He was born in 1925. He finished his bachelor's of science in geology in 1945. And he was my professor at Colorado School of Mines and he had been teaching there for over 20 years. So when he was in school as a geologist, plate tectonics was not even taught, which is pretty crazy because when we talk about geology and we think about um, conceptualizing geology and geologic time, what that means to think about something being, you know, 100 million years old, and we talk about rocks and formations and how different the earth has been, and we try to conceptualize that. Meanwhile, this theory has only been around for, you know, 70 years. That's pretty crazy to think about uh, in terms of how much geology has changed in our science just in the last less than 100 years. So what are the different evidence for plate tectonics? We're going to talk about all of these individually. So first is the fit of the continents, the locations of past glaciations, the distribution of climatic belts, the distribution of fossils and matching geologic units. Okay, so for the fit of the continents, have you ever looked at the earth and wondered why it looks like it could fit together as one puzzle piece? Well, Wegener concluded that the fit was too good to be coincidence. And he concluded that the fit must, they must have fit together at one point. So if we look at, uh, for example, Brazil, and how Brazil can fit very nicely here on the western part of Africa. You can see the exact same shape here. And same with parts of North America, like Northeast uh, United States here with you know, the Northwest part of Africa and parts of Asia, uh, parts of Europe, excuse me. So this fit he observed with a lot of other uh, continents and determined that it was too good to be true and that the, they must have fit together at some point. And he was able to support that with the idea of uh, looking at past glaciations. So glaciers are rivers or sheets of ice that flow across land surface. And as glaciers retreat, with it, it carries sediment or glacier, glacial till. Uh, we might refer to it as moraine. And it also leaves these striations in the rock. And that's because ice, as it as it retreats, it can it can really carve out the rock and leave behind these um, uh, really deep grooves or striations in the rock. So if we have Pangaea uh, here around the South Pole, uh, as all these continents are together and Antarctica is covered in a glacier, we see the same glacier pattern and glacier striations on other continents. So during the time of Pangaea, there are similarities in these glacier striations um, on all of these continents, which supports that they were once together. We can also see this with climate belts. Um, 
So parts of Pangaea were once you know, much further south. Again, here's that glacier covering Antarctica and parts of what we now know today as Southern Africa and Southern South America. And so uh, as Pangaea, the, mo the more Northern part of Pangaea would, uh, would be around the equator. And so at, at this part of the continent around the equator, we would have more tropical climate and we'd see things like reefs um, or swamps. And then further North, you'd see evidence of desert sand. And so parts of the world that were once near the equator and quite tropical are now um, quite different climate. We have, um, you know, somewhere, it, you know, parts of North America and parts of Northern Europe are completely covered in um, glaciers because they're so much further north. So those were once, you know, maybe dry desert regions. And we support this with rock records and uh, different uh, geologic evidence to support this with, with rock formations as well as um, fossils. So when we talk about um, what type of fossils we see, when we think about modern day and we think about um, the animal like a kangaroo, we usually associate the kangaroo with Australia. And that's because a kangaroo isn't really the type of animal that could cross all the way uh, across the Indian Ocean. And the same kind of concept applies to why plate tectonics was an accepted theory is because we have distribution of fossils during, um, uh, we have distribution of fossils across continents that doesn't make sense uh, if they were so far apart like we observe today. So at the time of Pangaea, species of plants and animals existed in these regions. And after the plates split and are in the present day configuration, there's fossils that show the same animal across uh, the different continents. So for example, here in Africa and South America, indicated by these blue dots here, is the Mesosaurus. And we have fossil evidence of the Mesosaurus living on both continents. And that's the same here uh, with the other, the dots indicate not just um, animals, but also uh, fauna and plants. So here's a, a fossil remain of the Mesosaurus, which is a crocodile-like reptile that lived in the, the early Permian age. And this was found in South, uh, Southern Africa and Eastern South America. And it would be impossible for the Mesosaurus to swim between the continents. And the only way that we'd be able to find evidence of the Mesosaurus on both continents is that they were once together and are only now split apart by a vast ocean. Uh, like I had uh, said, we also show evidence of matching geologic units. So Precambrian rock uh, occurs on the eastern coast of South America, and that matches uh, parts of west, the western coast of Africa, which are now separated by you know vast oceans. But there's similar rock formations between South America and Africa, which now again this looks very puzzle piece like and how they fit together. We also see similar features of the Appalachian Mount Mountains, which is on the uh, northeastern part of North America, and how these resemble similar um, belts all the way up through eastern Greenland. And we see that on uh, the northwestern part of Africa and uh, like the Caledonian Mountains, which is uh, northern Scandinavia up through Norway. So we see uh, rock evidence of these similar geologic units um, across continents that are now separated by oceans. So Wegner was really ahead of his time. His theory was criticized by geologists. And some of those criticisms were questions like, well, how, how does this happen? How does how do the plates uh, come together and then are, are moved apart by hundreds of miles? Why are the plates moving? What's the driving mechanism? So there was a lot of questions that he just wasn't able to answer in his time, but he had this theory. And of course, now that we have other scientific record, we're able to, to prove this theory. So one of those ways that we're able to prove it is through pale paleomagnetism. So when rocks are formed, they inherently get the magnetic minerals and when the, the rock is formed, there's uh, an inherent magnetic north associated with those rocks. And this is called 
the rocks, they preserve their paleomagnetism. And this is a, a record of the Earth's magnetic field at that time that the rock is formed. So uh, have you ever wondered why a compass always points to the north? Well, this is kind of a trick question because the north is actually always changing and the magnetic pole um, can flip and is, is um, slightly changing over time. Okay, so the Earth's magnetic field. We have a North Pole and we have a South Pole. And uh, what creates the Earth's magnetic field is the circulation of liquid iron in the Earth's core. And this creates a dipole, which is um, basically a bar magnet, um, which has a, a positive end and a negative end. The Earth's dipole intersects at the surface at two points, which is known as the magnetic poles. And currently, the magnetic poles are pretty close to the geographic poles. Um, however, they are just slightly off from each other. And the magnetic poles are constantly moving. The polarity can flip frequently um, in, in geologic scale. So when I say that it can flip frequently, meaning every few tens of thousands to every few hundreds of thousands of years, the magnetic pole will completely flip. Um, but currently it's, it's slightly deviating uh, a little bit further away from the geographic North Pole. So there is a difference between the North Pole uh, geographically located as well as the North Pole magnetically located. So let's watch a video about the Earth's magnetic poles. Did you know that Earth has two North Poles? There's the geographic North Pole, which never changes, and there's the magnetic North Pole, which is always on the move. And right now, it's moving faster than usual. Over the last 150 years, the magnetic North Pole has casually wandered 685 miles across northern Canada. But right now, it's racing 25 miles a year to the northwest. This could be a sign that we're about to experience something humans have never witnessed before, a magnetic polar flip. And when this happens, it could affect much more than just your compass. Right now on the surface of the planet, um, it looks like it's just a bar magnet, right? Our compasses are just, are just you know, pointing toward one pole at a time because there's a dominant two-pole dipole system. But sometimes, Earth doesn't always just have a single magnetic north and south pole. Evidence suggests that for hundreds to thousands of years at a time, our planet has had four, six, and even eight poles at a time. This is what has happened when the magnetic poles flipped in the past. And when it happens again, it won't be good news for humans. Now you might think, that eight poles must be better than two. But the reality is that multiple magnetic fields would fight each other. This could weaken Earth's protective magnetic field by up to 90% during a polar flip. Earth's magnetic field is what shields us from harmful space radiation, which can damage cells, cause cancer, and fry electronic circuits and electrical grids. With a weaker field in place, some scientists think this could expose planes to higher levels of radiation, making flights less safe. This could also disrupt the internal compass in many animals, which use the magnetic field for navigation. Even more extreme, it could make certain places on the planet too dangerous to live. But what exactly will take place on the surface is less clear than what will undoubtedly happen in space. Satellites and crewed space missions will need extra shielding we'll have to provide ourselves. Without it, intense cosmic and solar radiation will fry circuit boards and increase the risk of cancer in astronauts. Our modern way of life could cease to exist. We know this because we're already seeing a glimpse of this in an area called the South Atlantic Anomaly. Turns out, the direction of a portion of the magnetic field deep beneath this area has already flipped. And scientists say that's one reason why the field has been steadily weakening since 1840. As a result, the Hubble Space Telescope and other satellites often shut down their sensitive electronics as they pass over the area, 
and astronauts on the International Space Station report seeing a higher number of bright flashes of light in their vision, thought to be caused by high-energy cosmic rays that the weaker field can't hold back. Since experts started measuring the anomaly a few decades ago, it has grown in size and now covers a fifth of Earth's surface, with no signs of shrinking anytime soon. This is so extreme that it could be a sign we're on the brink of a polar flip, or we may already be in the midst of one. But scientists remain skeptical, mainly because... The last thing the poles reversed was 780,000 years ago. So it's, it's not, we don't have an oral record. <laughs> Turns out 780,000 years is over double the time that Earth usually takes between flips. Since the last mass extinction, there've been, uh, there been reversals roughly every 300,000 years. So what gives? Well, scientists haven't figured it out yet. It's unnerving to think that our modern way of life, banking, the stock exchange, missile tracking, GPS, relies on the outcome of something we can neither predict nor control. One study went so far as to estimate that a single giant solar storm today could cost the US up to $41.5 billion a day in damages. And that's with the Earth's magnetic field at its current strength. It's frightening to even imagine the devastation a storm would bring to an Earth with a magnetic field only 10% as strong as it is now. We may not be able to stop a polar flip, but we can at least start to take measures to minimize the damage. The first step? Figure out what's going on with this wacky field. On the hunt are the European Space Agency's swarm satellites that are currently collecting the most precise data on the strength of Earth's magnetic field. Right now, they could be our greatest hope for solving this riddle. Okay, well, that could have been a little bit dramatic. Don't worry about the magnetic poles flipping. But it is um, interesting to think about how reliant we are on understanding what magnetic north means um, in our technology, in our navigation system, even in our phones. Um, we use a lot of uh, we, we rely on understanding where magnetic north is. So if that were to flip, it would be a, a big challenge for us in our um, everyday life. But don't worry too much about it because when we talk about the earth is due for earthquake or the earth is due for a magnetic, magnetic uh, flip, um, we talk about potentially it being in the next 10,000, 100,000 years. So don't worry too, don't dwell on it, okay? Okay, so I had mentioned that um, paleomagnetism is one of those things that we use for evidence um, for uh, plate tectonics. So let's talk a little bit more about pa uh, paleomagnetism. So that's when the, the rock, as it's formed, preserves the Earth's magnetic field at that time. And so rocks like through a, a volcano, for example, uh, contain magnetic minerals. And they're like little little baby magnets, um, and they have their own little associated magnetism with them that are uh, when they are formed and cooled, they align with the magnetic field at the time that they're formed. Okay, so when the lava cools and solidifies into a rock, they uh, the little tiny magnetic crystals grow, and these crystals are then oriented with the magnetic forces, and as they cool. Um, these little tiny magnetic forces, like think about like little tiny um, mini little compasses, lock into that that magnetism and into a permanent parallelism. So if we look over at this diagram here, this picture, so as hot lava flow from a volcano, for example, starts to cool, and this arrow shows that the Earth's dipole is pointing in a southerly direction. So currently, uh, this is this is somewhat similar to the dipole uh, of today, but uh, imagine that it's a completely different orientation or something. The rocks that uh, have not completely cooled yet have a, a totally random orientation, but as they cool, these uh, little um, minerals within the rock they align with the Earth's dipole. So as it's as it's cooling, all these rocks then take on the magnetic field of the Earth at that time. And the, as the video showed, the Earth's magnetic field has flipped and changed, and it's currently changing. Um, it's, it's about 
10 degrees off of geographic north. Um, and so the, the magnetic pole keeps moving. And so when we look at the, the Earth's uh, geologic record, we can see how, um, how these rocks have, uh, we can actually date them, or we can say that they're different from each other just based on the paleomagnetism. Okay, keep moving my little face around, here we go. So the apparent polar wander path, this is the proof of continental drift. Um, and so the, we have the paleopole, which is the supposed position of the Earth's magnetic north pole. And using the concept that the Earth's magnetic north has changed, uh, we can track the location of where that north has been and plot it in an in succession with each other um, to see how the, the um, North Pole has changed over time and how the, the polar has, the polar North has wandered. Um, so successive positions of dated paleopoles trace a curved line, which is the apparent polar wander path. So you can see over geologic time how far that um, path has changed. So here's our current magnetic North is quite close to the geographic north, but it wasn't always that way. So at 100 um, million years ago, it was quite different than 200 million and, and so on and so forth. And we can see uh, we can see this change in the polar north or this um, polar wandering path in the record because we have all these different uh, rock samples here. If we, if we look at what their magnetic north is over geologic time, this is how we create that path and we can plot it on the globe. So each continent has its own polar water path. It's not the pole that moves relative to fixed continents, but rather how the continents that move relative to a fixed pole. So if we think about how magnetic north, if we talk about geographic north and the differences between the two. So each continent must move with respect to each other. So if the continents are fixed, then the pole moves relative to the continent. If the pole is fixed, then the continent must drift relative to that pole. Okay, so let's look at plate tectonics in the future, which I really like this video. Um, instead of just directly showing you or embedding this video, I'm gonna pull it up myself on YouTube and uh, hopefully you have the audio of me talking over it. So what I'm gonna do is full screen, yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, what I want to do is we're going to speed this guy up and we're going to mute it because the music on this video is not very good. Okay, let's, let's crank it up here. Okay. Now full screen. Okay, so this video is um, is showing what uh, the plate tectonics will look like in the future. So we're starting off with about 20 million years ago. Uh, so this is showing so this is showing how uh, the plates have um, starting with present and how they uh, would would move together into Pangaea. So we're, we're stepping back in time first. So now we're at 90 million years ago. Now you can really see how Africa and South America are coming together. Okay, now we can see at around 140 million years, you can see how North America is now really coming close to, this was Africa. Remember that this was uh, Africa here. So now we can see that these two are really coming together as about 180 million years. Okay, so I'm going to hit pause on this. So we've, um, We've stepped back into about 200 million years ago, and this is what uh, Pangaea is basically. And now we're going to go back in time closer to present day, and then it's going to project it into the future.
Okay, I broke it. Here we go. Okay, now we're coming back in time. So now we're seeing the continents were once together and now they're drifting further apart from each other. And we can see the shape of North America really taking place. And now we see Antarctica separating uh, from South America and Africa. Now again, here at around 100 million, you can see the two uh, South America is separating from Africa. Now we can see the formation all the way up here of Greenland. Greenland has now separated on its own. Australia is moving a little bit further north. Okay, so here we are at close to present day. And now let's see what's gonna happen to the plates in the future. So you can really see how uh, they were diverging further away. And as they move further away, uh, around 250 million years in the future, it's going to be one large mass. So let's look at that again. Okay, here's present day. So we have this really large divergent boundary here, and that's going to continue to spread. And as it continues to spread uh, and then change shape, the continents are going to be forced together. You can really see that we lost a lot of Antarctica um, and how the, the continents are going to be squished back together after about 250 million years. So this looks at, um, if you wanna to continue to watch this video, I'll put a link to it. Um, but what this shows is, is a little bit more detail of the continents interacting with each other during different uh, geologic times. Okay. Okay. So next up, the discovery of seafloor spreading. So uh, bathymetry is the depth of the ocean floor. So remember when we first introduced this word, we talked about how topography is the change of elevation on top of the Earth's surface. Bathymetry is the change of elevation of the seafloor. So we have bathymetric profiles uh, that are updated frequently and reveal important features like mid-ocean ridges, fracture zones, deep ocean trenches, and seamount chains. So let's look at those individually. Okay, so mid-ocean ridges. So a mid-ocean ridge, uh, it's the floor beneath the all major oceans, uh, which includes the abyssal plains, which are broad and relatively flat oceans that are about four to five kilometers below the sea level. So mid-ocean ridges are submarine mountain ranges, basically. And uh, the peaks are only two to two and a half kilometers below the sea level. Mid-ocean ridges are roughly symmetrical. So if we look at uh, one of the largest mid-ocean ridges between um, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean between North America and Africa, if we look at a cross-section view of that, here's the continental shelf, here's North America. And as we look at this ridge, it's like a little mountain range that occurs underneath the ocean. And again, over here on the right-hand side, this is where Africa is. So in between, this mid-ocean ridge has these, uh, these features that we can see um, from aerial view, we can see these little mountain ranges. In fact, let's go look at it on uh, Google Earth. Okay, here we are in my favorite Google Earth. So let's see if we can find a mid-ocean ridge. And well, what do you know? There it is. Can you see it? Here's North America, here's Africa. You can see this mid-ocean ridge just from aerial photography. And you, you may have seen this on a map and not thought too much about it, but really what it is are these um, underwater mountains. And you can see here that there's a clear uh, orientation to, like there's a line that connects all of this here. And you can see that there's um, 
striations going in the other direction too. And these are fractures of the mid-ocean ridge. Okay, so let's go back to our slideshow. So I just talked about how you can see those fractures. And so that's an example of the fracture zone. So surveys reveal the narrow ba uh, bands of vertical fracks, um, vertical cracks, excuse me, and broken up rock of the ocean floor of the mid-ocean ridge. So fracture zones lie roughly at right angles to the mid-ocean ridge and interrupt the continuity of the ridge access. Uh, access. So if we look at the mid-ocean ridge in uh, this little cartoon version, you could see how there's a fracture zone of the ridge uh, crest, um, and you can see how it's been fractured uh, perpendicular to that. So if we look at that again in aerial view, let's see if we can we can see that. So you have this this line. If you can see my mouse, but if we look more closely, we can see that there's a fracture that's going in the west to east orientation. And if you really look at how this line uh, lines up here, you have the mid ocean ridge here, and then it jumps. And then here's the mid ocean ridge crest here. So this is a fracture that's going roughly west east, and we have the mid ocean ridge that's going roughly north south. So that's an example of a fracture. Okay, so deep ocean trenches. So along much of the perimeter of the Pacific Ocean, the ocean floor reaches significant depths greater than five kilometers. And these are elongated troughs, um, which are called deep ocean trenches. And trenches can border volcanic arcs. So we see trenches uh, on the western edge of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then these little features here are called seamounts. So if we look at a uh, cross section, um, we can see how we have these like little volcanic islands, for example, and then a very deep trench. And some of these other features, um, like little seamounts. So if we go to the Pacific Ocean, Let's zoom out and we go over onto the Pacific side. We can see uh, we can see these trenches here, these really deep and dark features. This is it's much darker in color because there's uh, less light and therefore difficult, more difficult to visualize with um, aerial photography. And then all these little features over here, those are seamounts. So this is a location of where we have a trench. Okay, so in a seamount chain, this is where we have numerous volcanic islands that poke up through the ocean floor, like the Hawaiian Islands, those are seamount chains. Um, seamount chains can also be isolated submarine mountains, which were once volcanoes, but no longer erupt. And we can see that in the Gulf of Alaska, um, where you have these seamounts. And these are these are underwater. So this was once uh, a chain of volcanic islands um, that are now completely covered with water. Uh, so there's there's some differences in the Hawaiian Islands, and they're formed through hotspots, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But when we talk about uh, how different the islands are from each other. Um, they're pretty they're pretty drastic. So if you've ever been to Hawaii, you may have visited Kauai, which is younger and it's younger because it's green and uh, I'm sorry, Kauai is um, older and it's it's green and lush and has had longer to grow all these plants versus the the big island of Hawaii is still volcanically active. And so you don't really see all that lushness. It's still growing. In fact, it, there's volcanic activity right now, it's more barren. So there's there's drastic differences even within the, uh, the Hawaiian islands. Okay, so so far what we've talked about is continental drift theory and the evidence of plate tectonics and where the, um, the theory of plate tectonics came from. So the things that we talked about are uh, how fossils can be traced across the different continents and glaciation. Um, and we looked at um, we looked at how the plates have moved apart over time. So these are some of the high level learnings that we've talked about so far.